it's David McGillivray here with Little Did You Know. It's a chat show in which I talk to people I find interesting. I hope you agree. Now, today's edition of the show, I'm going to make a bold statement. It's going to completely change your concept of sexuality. It's true. And this is how it's going to happen. I have met my uh, guest today before. Uh, first of all, I interviewed him for a magazine called QX, and then later that year we did meet in New York. He's uh, joining us today again from his home in Brooklyn, New York. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning, Robert Feinstein. Good morning, David. Nice to be here nice to be with you again after all this time it's been a few years now i want everyone to know your story the story i learned when i first met you in 2007 but to do that we're going to have to go back a long way you were born premature can you tell us what happened yes i was born on december 1st 1949 and I weighed one pound 14 ounces. Uh, I was born three months prematurely so I was put in the incubator for three months. At the time they didn't know that giving too much oxygen was detrimental to a premature baby's eyes. Many premature babies were coming out of the incubator blind, but they didn't know why. So when I came out of the incubator, I was totally blind. Many, many babies had this fate. Those born in the late 30s up to around 1954, when they finally discovered that it was too much oxygen. Now, some babies who came out of the incubator were able to see some. Some could see fairly well, some could see normally, and some could see like light or shadows, even if they lost this ability, and many did when they got older. I was among a minority of kids, of babies, who had absolutely no visual input at all. So when I came out of the incubator, I was totally blind and I wasn't able to see anything. I didn't keep going. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. I, I didn't know what light was or dark was or anything like that. So I um that was how it happened. So you, this is the equivalent, totally blind, to being profoundly deaf. And, and this is quite rare, isn't it? Yes, it is, because most, uh, well, I know some people in my situation, but most can say, I, I see a little bit of light, I can tell if the light is on, but I never uh, was able to. And one thing that was funny was I used to kind of fool the eye doctor, because he'd say, is the light on or off? And he was very stupid because he would hold like a big light to my face and I could feel the heat. So I'd say, oh, the light is on and the light is off. And um, he'd say, Mrs. Feinstein, I think your son can see light. And my mother said, he cannot. He absolutely cannot. He, he, he's, he's making a fool of you. And the doctors wouldn't believe her, but it was true. <laughs> Now, just a moment ago, uh, some of our viewers will have noticed that you uh, reacted to something, as we say, off screen. And that is because you have a helper there with you. His name is uh, Britton Malcolmson. Say hello, Britton. Hello. There he is. We're going to talk to Britton as well later in the program, uh, but perhaps only on Patreon. Uh, if you're a... a, a can't pronounce the word subscriber, you'll know that you can go to Patreon as soon as the show's finished. You'll find us waiting for you. If you're not, here's the link uh, to Patreon. You'll find it so easy and cheap to join us and learn more about my guests. Um, now, uh, Robert, you just mentioned your, your, your parents there. Now, did they decide to send you to uh, a, a school with sighted children? Yes, what happened was um, 
my mother wanted me to grow up in the neighborhood and I was very close to my mother and I was close to my aunts, mostly the women folk. And I just want to mention one thing, if you bear with me. Um, I spent most of my time listening to the women folk talk because a lot of my cousins, they, they, they liked me, but they, I couldn't really play with them and they weren't that interested in me. So the advantage of that was my parents spoke a different language and I learned the language because I used to just listen to them. So I was one of the few kids that picked up um, how to speak Yiddish where most of the kids didn't, but I was always with the uh, older folks. So I listened and I learned and I heard things I probably shouldn't have heard at my age, but it, it was interesting. But yes, I went to a special, actually it was a very, very good program I went to a regular school with sighted kids, but they had a special braille class for blind kids. And I was very lucky in that I had very good braille teachers and the braille teachers would teach me braille and teach me typing. And then I would spend a little time with the sighted kids in the classroom. And that was very good. And then I'd go back to the braille room where if there was a test, the braille teacher would read it to me and then I would um, take the test that way. You told me how you first discovered that you were blind. How was it? Well, I'm not sure what I might have mentioned, but I know that sometimes I would sit in class and I'd hear kids reading from books and I couldn't read the books because a lot of them weren't in braille. And then I would hear the teacher writing on the blackboard and I used to like the sound of the chalk but I realized that the kids could read what the teacher was writing and I couldn't. Now, I'm going to take you back now to when you were seven or eight. And uh, when we first spoke, you said that you very much liked human touch. You liked hugging everyone. But then when you were 10 years old or round about that age, you discovered that you were reacting differently to some people, didn't you? Yes, I would say maybe, I don't know if it was 10, maybe 10 to 12, but I found that I enjoyed hugging men more than I enjoyed hugging women. And I wasn't quite sure why, but eventually I always said that when I hugged a guy, it was a very nice feeling. And when I hugged a woman, or a girl, it was kind of like hugging a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> now, you also said that instinctively you knew that this wasn't, and I'm now doing quotation marks, right. I did because uh, I, I couldn't understand why I loved the touch of a guy. I used to ask my um, uncles to pick me up or I would like to sit in their lap and things like that. And I just wasn't interested in doing that with the uh, women. And I remember I asked my mother when I was about 10 to buy me a doll, which actually she did. I have to give her credit, but she must have said, boy, this guy is, this kid is not only blind, he's a little weird, but she, she did buy me a doll. <laughs> Robert, tell us what happened when you went to France. Well, I kind of knew that um, I was gay when I was in toward the end of high school and in college, but I didn't really have any experiences because I didn't know how to meet people. And since I needed help from both guys and girls, it was just a very awkward situation. My first roommate, who has unfortunately passed away, he had AIDS. He was gay and he used to get it on with different people and I would hear the bed squeaking and I didn't know what the heck was going on. And he would never tell me, I'd say, what are you doing? He'd say, oh, nothing, don't worry about it. But I just heard the strangest noises coming from his section of the room. You know, the bed would squeak and it, some of the you know guys were pretty vocal, I said, what a strange way he has of playing with people. And, but I had no idea, of course, I, I was very naive. I didn't know, you know, what gay people did. Well, I just knew. Let me 
me ask you one thing now. You mentioned that you were well into your teens before you were absolutely sure of the difference between boys and girls. Is that, isn't that right? Yes, uh, I know it sounds kind of stupid on my part, but because I couldn't see, I just knew that women had higher voices and um, men had hairier arms, but I didn't really know anything about breasts or, um, I don't know if I can say this, um, vaginas or anything. Can um, vagina on this show, Robert. I'm sorry? You can say uh, yeah. And, um, you know, penises. I, did. I mean, I knew I had a penis, but I didn't know that women didn't. I just didn't know anything. But and something, uh, something changed in France, didn't it? Well, but even before I got to France, I, 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 I guess when I was about 15, 16, I started to, I started to know and my aunt would tell me things and sometimes I would ask um, people and they would tell me things. And in France, I actually had my first, um, well, I had played around a little bit before, but I guess my first real gay experience. Okay, how was it for you? Well, it was very nice. He was another blind guy. He was uh, an Algerian fellow. And we were just talking and um, we started hugging. And then the next thing I knew, he started, again, can I just say honestly what, what he did or? Of course you can. Okay. <laughs> he, he just started, you know, touching my cock and I got a hard on and I touched his and he got a hard on. And then we uh, jerked each other off and it was a, a very nice feeling. I thought, this is really nice. And I guess he wanted to reassure himself. And he kept saying, mais moi, moi, je ne suis pas gay. Me, I'm not gay. Moi, je ne suis pas gay. Je fais ça seulement pour uh, vous amuser. I'm doing that only to, to enjoy, so you can enjoy it. Mais moi, je ne suis pas gay. But he was definitely gay. <laughs> Yes, uh, Robert, this may not be a surprise, but this happens in the sighted world as well. Now, you told me that after that experience, and this is a quote from you, you were ready to conquer the gay world. Is that what happened? Well, after I got back from France, um, I got my own apartment. My parents helped me get my apartment, and I decided that I would like to meet more gay people. But the problem was... I didn't really have a way to do that because there was no internet. I didn't have anyone I could ask. Um, I had uh, a few people that told me about different gay bars. I think I called the gay switchboard and I started by going to a, a few gay bars, but unfortunately it was a real disaster for me. And I realized that it wasn't going to be that easy for me to, uh, to meet gay people. Okay, so I know the answer to this, but please share it with all of us. Why didn't gay bars work for you? Well, first of all, it was very hard to find them because I needed help. So I would ask people in the street, you know, I would be on Christopher Street, which is a gay street, you know, where is a certain bar? And some people just took me there. Or some people said, are you sure you want to go there? And I said, oh, yes, I, I do. And they said, but that's for gay people. I said, well, you know, I want to see what it's like. And a few people said, well, you really shouldn't, you know, um, this is very against your know, Christian teaching. And, but many people did, you know, take me there. But when I got to the bar, it just didn't work out because first of all, the noise level was so loud that when I walked in, I couldn't hear anything. And someone showed me to a seat, but I couldn't talk to anyone because the music was incredibly loud. And because I couldn't see, I was basically rendered deaf and blind. And I would touch the person next to me. Some people were nice. They would speak to me, even though I could hardly hear them. But then people said, well, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking with someone else. And I realized that I had no way of knowing, you know, who was with somebody or who was alone. And I just sat there and I felt isolated and I felt very unhappy. And after going about three or four times, I said, no, this is not working. And I, I stopped going. And then I tried to go to some groups where people would meet up and have discussions, but that really didn't work very well for me either because mostly people just ignored me. So then I figured, well, maybe it's because I'm very heavy. 
So I went to a group called Girth and Mirth. I don't think it exists anymore. It was a group for very heavy gay people, but the same thing happened. People, they were nice to me. They would sit me down, but nobody really wanted to bother with me. And then I just realized that this was not going to be easy and I would probably be pretty much of an outsider. Now I want to add here, here that many blind people may have had different experiences. Some people say they met sighted people easily, but I kind of find that hard to believe. Well, I was fortunate enough when I wrote the article, Robert, to um, meet three gay men, uh, two in America and one here in London. And uh, uh, the other guy I met in, uh, in America said um, to me that quite often people would come up to him and talk to his dog but wouldn't talk to him. Did you have that experience? Uh, sometimes, sometimes, but um, people would talk to me, but not in a situation where I would like them to, would have liked them to talk to me. And I need to make one thing very clear to your uh, listeners. There's a very big difference between people who are blind, but who grew up sighted and people like me who never saw. People for some reason who grew up sighted, maybe they have different mannerisms, I don't really know. They tend to do much better. So you were learning about life as you went along, new things all the time, how to behave, how to react. You were out in the real world. And how was it? Well, um, I think people would be surprised at the things I didn't know. I think even sometimes Britain may be surprised, like he knows me very well. So he'll mention something and he'll say, do you, do you know what that is? Sometimes I will and sometimes I won't. But one thing you learn very early when you're in my situation is not to admit to people what you don't know, because people think you're, you know, like a retard or stupid or anything. So I don't often say, like, for example, one thing I like to point out, the only reason I know that there's a moon is because people tell me, but um, I, you know, I have no idea what it looks like, or I mean, I know it's up, up there somewhere, but you know what it is. And um, so a lot of what you learn is just from what you hear around you. I don't know how people can look at each other and you know, make contact from across a room, how people can immediately um, um, draw people to them. I mean, there's so much that goes on that's uh, nonverbal. And I know that um, sometimes Britain and I will watch TV together or maybe a documentary and he explains things and it amazes me what a person can see. Because yeah. to me, a television screen is just a, uh, it's just a piece of glass and it's um, hot. <laughs> On the whole, it, uh, am I right in saying, Robert, you, you, you were fortunate in having a reasonably good education, but it didn't include any kind of sexual education at all? No. Do you think that situation is the same today for blind children? I don't really know. I, I'm not in touch with a lot of young blind kids. I know a lot of blind kids are mainstreamed. You know, they go to regular schools like I did, but I don't really know. There are much fewer young blind kids because what caused my blindness no longer exists all that much. So the amount of totally blind kids is much, much lower. Robert, we're going to take a break now to see a trailer for an, uh, a peccadillo release. And uh, as is so often the case on this show, it's very appropriate. Uh, the film is called The Way He Looks, and it's from Brazil. It's about a blind schoolboy who falls in love with a classmate. Have a look at this and join us again in a couple of minutes. <risos> e você, não se preocupa com isso? Com o quê? Ué, vai passar a vida inteira sem beijar ninguém, não. Giovanna. Aqui é o 211? É, aqui sim. Como é que se chama? Gabriel. 
vou te falar uma coisa, esse menino novo é muito fofo. É o Gabriel. A gente vai fazer trabalho com o marido dele me encontrar aqui. Léo, hoje é o dia do eclipse. Vamos ver? Minha mãe nunca vai deixar eu ir. A gente pode ir escondido. Sei, sozinho de noite, no escuro? Olha, pra mim é sempre escuro, tá? Não precisa dessa neurose toda. As coisas estavam ótimas antes de você chegar. O que importa é que ele não liga mais pra mim. Ele trocou por você em 10 segundos. Você tá falando assim comigo, cara? Você tá nervoso? Porque sim, porque fica todo mundo querendo me controlar e ninguém quer que eu veja ninguém. That's uh, a film called The Way He Looks, and I saw that film in Lisbon when it was the opening film of Queer Lisboa, uh, an LGBT uh, festival. I absolutely loved it. It's a charming film, and at that time, I know that uh, Portugal was trying to get that film entered as the best foreign film at the Academy Awards. They failed. I, it's a great shame because it's an absolutely lovely film, a real crowd pleaser. Is there any chance, Robert, that you've heard of that film, The Way He Looks? No, I haven't. I never heard of it. Mm. Now, um, uh, people watching now can see the film on peccadillopod.com. Tell me, Robert, is, is technology um, Does it now exist to uh, uh, read English subtitles on films for blind people? No, that doesn't exist as far as I know. But I'm afraid I am really the wrong person to ask about technology because I'm like a dinosaur. But um, no, I don't think it does exist. Um, I know that they do have what they call audio description where they describe what's happening, but Britain and I watched the documentary. What's the documentary called about the girl that left the Hasidic movement? Do you remember? Well, we watched the, the fictional one called Unorthodox. Unorthodox. Yeah. And yeah. E even though it had, subs it had a, a, a description explaining, I needed Britain's help a great deal. Otherwise, I would have missed a lot. Ah. Now, th th this is where I, I think Britain uh, comes into the conversation. So you could, Britain, in, in, in theory, read subtitles for Robert, could you? Should I come in here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we, we can do subtitles, but a lot of the time um, I have to kind of decide. There's a lot to describe just visually at the same time as what's happening with the dialogue. So it's kind of like a mix of back and forth trying to get dialogue um, and like visual cues and stuff. But, <clears throat> oh, forgive me. Uh, technology has advanced to the stage where, um, uh, Robert, you can hear your emails. Yes, yes. And uh, when you type an email to me, for example, something is telling you which letters you're pressing. Yes, well, well, I know how to type pretty well because all blind kids learn to type when we're in the third grade. So I just type and then I don't really listen to the computer, but after I type it, I reread it. And if I hear a mistake, I can correct it. But what I wanted to mention about the subtitles is if if a film has absolutely no English, it just wouldn't pay to watch it because Britain would have to not only read me the subtitles, but he'd have to describe what it just would be it just would be too much. Well, I hope this technology will exist in the near future, 
Robert, because it would open up a whole new world, wouldn't it, of foreign films? I guess, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Now, you told me um, a, a while back when we first spoke in 2007, this is a very interesting statement, I want you to explain it. I can't get turned on over the phone. What did you mean by that? Well, I'm not sure. That may have changed a little bit. Um, I'm finding I do like certain people's voices and I don't really get turned on, but there are some voices that I like to listen to and uh, things like that. But actually to, to know whether a person, you know, really turns me on, I probably have to meet them because there's a um, feel when the person hugs me, there's the smell if he's wearing cologne or something like that. Like people that smoke a lot, I, I find that kind of a bit of a turn off. So they would have to maybe chew a bit of gum to, to help me out. So I guess it is easier for me to meet people in person. Like for example, I would like to meet you if you ever come to New York and it would be nice to give you a hug and be able to have some kind of idea of who you are. Right now you have a lovely voice, but I, no, I can't really, you're, you're right. I, I really can't. Um, well, you, you said to me, we spoke on the phone uh, yesterday um, in readiness for this chat today. And one of the first things you said, um, because I mean, Alas, you, you can't actually remember we met in, in New York in 2007 and you said, did we hug? That's very important to you, isn't it? Yes, yes it is because um, I like hugging a person, especially if they're wearing maybe a short sleeve and it's not a sexual thing, it's just something I like. I like the feel of feeling another person and having them hug me. You know, I, I'd like to mention, if it's okay, when I told you I didn't remember meeting you, I feel very badly about that because my memory, because I have no visual to back it up, is not very good. For example, I know that I lived in France, but I don't remember very much about being there. I mean, I know I was there. I know I even learned to take the Metro by myself but I don't really remember doing it. I, I know it sounds very, very strange, but if I don't have any contact with a person, then, and a person just talks to me maybe once or twice, I probably won't remember them. I don't remember when we met, if we did hug each other, I, I just have no memory of having met you. And again, that's not you, it's, 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 it's my problem and I feel badly about it. But I didn't want to tell you I did remember when I didn't, you know, I didn't want to lie. Don't feel uh, bad about this, uh, Robert. What's going to happen uh, later is that uh, I'm going to remind you about some of the things we talked about when we met. And uh, I'm hoping that it will jog your memory. Now, what was very interesting to hear uh, about you meeting people is that you can easily be turned off by smell. And this is something that sighted people are just not sufficiently aware of. So you don't like sweat, you don't like cigarette smoke. Well, well some sweat is okay, but cigarette smoke I really don't like. Um, no, I, I really don't. <laughs> Thank God Britain doesn't smoke. <laughs> Phew. If he did, I'd have to like spray him every time he came. No, we don't want to go through all that. Mm -hmm. Very important, and I learned this from the other blind guys I spoke to, is, is touch. So even a touch on the shoulder can be significant. Is that right? Oh, definitely. Definitely. And um, I like when there's a little bit of touch between people. Um, I think... Um, Again, my memory of France is vague, but I think French were a bit more touchy than the Americans. But I, again, I don't remember too well. It's really strange. Oh, they are, Robert. They are. People touch a lot more on uh, continental Europe. And there is even hissing between men. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. On, the, on the cheek? On the cheek, yes, yes. Um, not on the lips at the moment. Not... <laughs> 
actually, I'm not a big kisser. I'm not crazy about kissing to tell you. It's all right, but it's, I don't know. I don't like it really. <laughs> what, what, what about voice quality? Um, uh, what kind of voice do you like? It's funny, that doesn't really matter that much. If, if, if a person sounds to me like a nice person, a sincere person, I tend to like them. Um, uh, sometimes I've met people that sound real tough, but I, I can tell that they're basically nice. Uh, and sometimes I'll meet people and I just say, oh, I think this person is not all that sincere. I think he's all that nice and I won't like them as much, but I could be wrong. Um, for example, um, I have a fellow who cleans for me. His name is Moses. And when I first met him, he sounded like a gangster. And um, I didn't think I wanted to really hire him, but he got a very good uh, reference. And then he turned out to be you know, very good. He cleans for me. He's been working with me for about three years. Huh. But uh, when I first met him, he said, hey, you know, I, I want to clean for you. There's no problem. Um, and I'll be happy to you make your apartment look very good. And I said, oh, God, he sounds awful. <laughs> I, I would have been a bit worried by that, uh, Rob. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it worked out. Now, this is something I wrote uh, about you in 2007, Robert. Here we go. Robert Feinstein should be consulted whenever there's a study into whether homosexuality is the result of nature, nurture, or both. It's because, Robert, sexuality, as far as sighted people are concerned, is, is defined almost by, by what we see. And it's very, very bad in the gay world. You know, it's all so visual. But we've got the wrong uh, conception about this. Obviously, we've known, we know now blind people can be gay. But you don't really know why, do you, Robert? No, I absolutely don't. And that's why I 100% believe that, at least in my case, and I'm sure in many cases, being gay is just the way you're born, is just the way you're wired. Uh, because I, as I mentioned, I didn't know the difference between men and women, and I it, it just happened. It's just the way I was wired. I was gay and that was that. So I absolutely believe that it's something that really is the way you're born. I suppose I wouldn't think people would choose it, but I know in my case, it's definitely 100% the way I was born. But people are, are still struggling about this, Robert. You know, people are still discussing whether you're born gay. Uh, none, there's, there's no general agreement about it, but you know, don't you? You were... I know 100 percent, and um, because otherwise it would make no sense. Why was it that when I was say 12 or 13, or maybe even 14, when I started hugging guys, man, I really liked it, and these poor women were like hugging vacuum cleaners. I had nothing to do with it. It just happened. <laughs> And I'm not putting down women. I love women, but I'm just not interested in them. Tell me, I mean, how often are you able to talk like this quite explicitly? Are there, are there any gay blind organizations where you can meet other gay blind men? There are. There is an organization and it was on uh, an email list. Now it's on Facebook, but I'm not a member of it because First of all, I can't do Facebook without help. These people are much more technical. Second of all, most of them are very clickish. Most of them had sight and lost it. Most of them grew up um, in the sighted world being gay. Um, most of them kind of act like being blind isn't a problem. They don't even tell people they're blind. They meet people and it just goes 100% well. And I find that a little hard to believe. I don't feel a part of them, so I'm not a member of it. I'm surprised uh, to hear that. Uh, in, uh, in the UK, uh, for example, there's a very old established group for gay deaf people. But here in the UK as well, as far as I'm aware, there's no organization for gay blind. What? Yeah, the deaf are much more uh, open about being gay. The blind, part of the problem is a lot of blind people, believe it or not, are very conservative. 
I guess they were raised with their families. Um, a lot of them are very Christian. And um, as I said, the gay blind people that I met from this particular group, they just have nothing in common with me. I don't really, um, I, I'd rather talk to a sighted person who's gay than them. Hmm. Now, what about internet dating? Does that work for you? I, I never did it. No. I, I never tried. Um, the only way I would do it is if, if I met someone on, on a website. Well, again, I would need a lot of help and that's awkward to ask a helper to do that. I really, the only one I could probably ask is, is Britain. I couldn't ask my other helpers to do that. And then I would have to talk to them. No, no, I've, I've never really done that. Well, I can. I, that's, I'm sorry. Go on. That's why I'm hoping that this program, I, I thought long and hard about it. And I'm hoping that if any people feel that they might want to make a friend, I, I would like that. Um, and you'll let me know at the end whether I can should give my email or maybe they can contact you or what's the best way. But if I made a few contacts, that would be great. But um, I have not had a lot of success in that department. I can tell you now, um, Robert, that probably you're not missing very much because um, one of the other guys I spoke to for the article said he had tried internet dating, but it just doesn't work for blind people because internet dating is all about instant gratification and blind people like to take it more slowly. Is that right? That's somewhat true. I mean, if I met someone and he, I guess he did all the right things. I probably would enjoy playing around with him, but the problem is there has to be a little bit more because when you're blind, you need more help. For example, um, if we went out to eat together, especially now, I don't get around that well anymore. He would have to guide me. I need help um, cutting my meat or buttering my bread. And so he would have to want a little more than just, you know, it's not gonna be like dating a sighted person. And there are blind people who are more capable than I am of doing things. And I used to feel bad about that, but I don't anymore. I am what I am and people have to accept it. And if they don't, there's really nothing I can do about it. Let's, um, we're coming up towards the end, but let's finally talk about uh, race, uh, Robert. And uh, one of the guys I met when I wrote the original article uh, is black. Ah, now, how does this work for a blind person? Do, when you can't see the color of a man's skin, does it matter in the slightest respect? The color of the skin doesn't matter at all. Um, what might matter is if a person has a little bit of a different way of speaking, I might notice it, you know, maybe a different accent, but certainly not in a bad way. In other words, um, if I met someone from Jamaica, I would notice that they don't speak the same way I do. Or if a person is an American black, maybe with a more uh, a Southern accent, I would notice it, but that's all. Um, actually, my roommate in college for the first, uh, for the second year, actually, when I was a sophomore, he's a black fellow and I'm still in touch with him. And the only thing I used to touch his hair, which was different, and also the palm of his hands was rougher than mine. But oh, no, that doesn't matter at all. We're, we're learning so much uh, from you, Robert. I can now tell you that the, uh, the, the black guy I spoke to all those years ago in 2007 also said that um, uh, blind people like, white blind people liked touching his hair because it was different. <laughs> he, he was fine with that. And uh, how about uh, how about this as well? He said, a Caribbean or a white guy will take my arm, but an African guy will take my hand, and that's all right with me. Huh. Isn't that interesting? That is it. Do African people walk more hand in hand? I don't. I don't know. I can tell you that in North Africa, it's quite common to see men holding hands. And really. Some of them are straight. Really? That's nice. I didn't know that. 
it's another it's another custom yes that we're not at all familiar with in the west that's very nice mm -hmm, it is isn't it um something tells me um robert that you've never had a gay blind role model no well do you remember that when we first had the conversation in 2007, I did bring up the subject of somebody relatively well known who is blind and allegedly gay? I think I do. <laughs> well, we're now going to end this on a cliffhanger because we're not going to talk about this guy right here on Little Did You Know. Well, let's face it, it's a bit risky, but we can on Patreon. It's an interesting story. So, Robert, I'm going to say right now, thank you very much for joining us here on Little Did You Know, but please stick around because there's a lot more things I want to talk to you about on Patreon. Robert, it's been it's been a pleasure, but please stay where you are. Okay, thank you. So, so what happens now? Uh, it's a case of me just saying, um, uh, for the benefit of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us, and please join us, us again next week when my guest will be Ian Freeman. He's involved with the Royal Variety Performance, which is actually happening again this year, next month. So there'll be a lot of stories about that. But from now, from me, David McGillivray, it's bye.